You're listening to Podium Podcast with former England rugby player Tom May and leading performance coach Simon Hartley. From locker room gossip to fascinating high performance insights, this is the show that invites some of the biggest names in the world of sport to discuss life on and off the field of play. Podium Podcast is brought to you by True Potential. To find out more, visit www.tplp.com. Laura Massaro, great to have you with us on the podcast. Uh, how is life where you are in the in the northwest? Is it as grim and as snowy as it is down here in the south southwest of London? Hi guys, thanks for having me on. Uh, it is, and it's pretty much like this most of the time. As most <laughs> southerners tell me, <laughs> um, it's cold. It's actually not bad, but it's it's crisp and it's really cold. So I'm I'm, I'm so looking forward to the weather changing. Oh, 100%, 100%. Hey, look, it's it's great to have you on the podcast. And uh, this is the debut for Simon and I, our first squash player or former squash player. Um, so, so great to have you on. Um, retired in 2019, um, multiple medalist doing my research. I, Simon will know, I, I, maths isn't one of my strong points, so I, I, I won't profess to have added them up because I'll probably get it wrong. But, um, but a mixture of, of, of silver and gold, um, world championships and, and Commonwealth Games. Um, you retired in 2019. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to beat about the bush with this question, but ha- how have you found retirement from professional sport? Well, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, I'd say, mainly because... I think I think in hindsight now looking back I've probably I probably picked the most ideal time to retire right before covid um it was it was a tough time for everybody involved in sport and so and and it was tough for me I guess as well coming out of sport and then trying to transition into the next stage of my life and then that getting put on hold straight away was also quite tough but it's it's actually been it's actually been really nice, I think. I mean, the lockdown was tough for everybody, as as I said, but it was also, I think most people you speak to have quite fond memories of the quietness that came with it and the stillness and, you know, totally different if you've got kids and, you know, homeschooling and everything. But those that, that time to actually be with family and the the things that people look back, although it was very hard, it was also, there's also some good memories, as particularly as time passes. I um, understand that that was not the case for everybody. Um, but that that was probably for us. We were just pottering around the house, getting out with the dog. Um, but it made it very hard to transition into that next stage of, of what I wanted to be my career. And that's taken a, lo- a long time to kind of get going again, um, particularly with just having a little boy or he's, he's 16 months now. So just coming out of, you know, we we're still wearing masks and doing COVID tests as I was, you know, have it going into labour with him and stuff. So it was quite different to to what it would be now. Um, but it's it's also been very enjoyable. I was ready to retire. It was the right time, which I'm sure we'll talk about um, how you decide on that. But that was part of my career. And that's exactly what I wanted to happen when I retired. That I didn't have any regrets and I feel that way. So I'm quite lucky. Did, um, did COVID uh, afford you a bit more time to, to work out exactly what you wanted from retirement? Because I think some people are forced into they're either forced into retirement or they know they want to retire, but probably don't have the, the time to make a good decision about what's what's next if they haven't planned ahead. Would yeah, so, give you a yeah. Bit, bit more room to think. Yeah, really good point. And one of the uh, former England players, or he was originally Scottish, Peter Nichols, uh, squash player, like legend of the game, he said, I, I started doing a little bit of work with him, him and his wife in America just to just to work with some girls out there and he he sort of said to me one day you know as I was finishing and he knew I was looking to kind of get back and get into the coaching side don't don't take don't say yes to everything that comes your way in that first year because you'll get offered a lot because people are quite keen you've retired you you know been quite been quite successful within the squash world and you will your your time will be demanded of but try not to just say yes to everything and I was like that I'm not going to do that. But I kind of really quickly realised how easy it was to just say yes, particularly when, you know, you're 
you feel like you're wanted a little bit. It's that trap, isn't it? That that trap of being a professional athlete and transitioning where the attention is all on you. You're walking out on big courts with crowds and you're a, you're a big name in that small little world that is squash. But then when you finish, no one cares anymore. And I was, when I was listening to one of your guys, your podcasts yesterday, that was exactly what I picked up from from that. Like once it's gone, it's gone. No one cares. And I actually had a chat with one of my players about it yesterday afternoon. I'm like, why do you want to do this? Um, and it's helpful to really make sure that you're aware of that while it's all going on. Yeah, I think, I think that's a challenge actually for, for a lot of early stage entrepreneurs, whenever they set up, um, that somebody comes along with an offer. And especially if it comes with some cash, they think, oh, I've got to grab that. I've got to grab that. And before they know it, they become really unfocused about what they want to do and create in the future deliberately. And they become really uh, opportunistic, you know, just kind of grab at anything um, and, and find it very difficult from that point to set any kind of direction. Yeah, I was quite lucky um, towards the end of my career and it linked back into what I just mentioned about working with Peter Nicola and his wife. I, I realised that that the way that I played squash and the way that I was at a person as a person were two very different entities. And I started to call the person who stepped on the squash court and that was in that arena, that was my brand. That was like my brand of squash and who I wanted to be. And I quite often got when I was away from the court, oh, you, you smile a lot more than I thought you would, or you're a lot nicer than I thought you were. And it was the game face and the the persona that you know all athletes have but that was what I sort of tried to try to call it the the brand and I talk about it to the young squash players that are coming through or any athletes that are coming through it's like you know you've got a choice do you want to be an apple or a, or a um you know like an apple or an android do you want to be a ben and jerry's or a hagen like there's that you can be an ice cream but you can then choose which how you're gonna how you're gonna do that and the way that I played squash was was my brand. And as the years went on, I, I, I am, I don't know if immersed is the wrong word, but I became more that brand without even trying to. And then I actually did try to. I, I really tried to become even more that brand that I wanted people to see. And I, I swear it, it won me a couple of points every, every match mm. because people didn't know what was going on and they thought that I was the person that I was that I was showing a little bit more and there was a heck of a lot of nerves and a little bit of insecurity underneath the surface but that wasn't what I showed on the surface at all. We hope you don't mind us interrupting the show with a very short message about our partners at the Podium podcast, True Potential. True Potential provide wealth management that's simple, effective and unique. Their expert advice, innovative investments, leading technology and dedicated support are all designed to help you do more with your money. Visit www.tplp.com now to find out more. Capital at Risk. True Potential Wealth Management and True Potential Investments are authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Thanks for listening. Now, let's get you back to this week's show. Simon, um, there's, there's a definite trait where, with athletes that, that I've noticed over these podcasts. Everyone says yes when they finish. Now, yeah. I think part of that is a fear of, I need money. Where is it coming from? Uh, I think the other part is, if I turn around to Laura in her, in her playing days and said, right, you've got to run X amount of sets of, of these, these runs, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. She's just going to say yes, because she feels like that is improving her. Now, I think, um, who was it? Uh, I can't remember who it was. But was talking about this this whole idea of enduring. Um, yeah. I think it was Jack Green, wasn't it? it was Jack Green, yeah. And, mm. and, and and I think that's an element of, of this yes mindset. It's just like, right, I'm in. Um, do, you th- do you think there's something in that? Uh, partly. I, I do think there's another element of this, though, which is that human beings find the void very difficult. You know, we find silence very difficult. We've got to fill it with something. We, and especially if we're walking into a future which has got a lot of unknowns around it, we want some kind of certainty. So when we see this expanse in front of us with nothing in it, we want to fill that with something. And the the opportunities will come along. Whether they're the right ones or not is a different question. And this, I think, is where we've got to be very selective because 
Because if not, if you just imagine it as a space, uh, like the garage or the loft or something like that, you could fill it with junk if you weren't careful and then it would be full. Or you can fill that space with the stuff that you want in it. But to do that, you've got to say no to as many things or potentially more things that you say yes to. And uh, and that's the difficult bit, I think, because because human beings don't like the void, the vacuum, the silence. You know, we're not comfortable with it. Yeah, I think it's. I think there's something that the void for, for me. For you see, see the transition as the void. That for athletes is a terrifying space because there is no structure. There yeah. is nothing you're ever used to. Um, and so maybe that forces the yes. I got forced into making some decisions that backfired massively. Um, I, I learned a bit more about what the corporate world is really about. <laughs> um, and, and you sort of, sort of toughen yourself up to that and, and you have to go through those learning experiences. But um, I, I, th I think there's something, there's definitely something in that, in that athletes just say yes, because it's, it's part, if a, if a coach says something, you just say yes to it. You know, that's that's the way you're, you're, you're developed, right, Laura? Yeah, definitely. I think you do. Uh, you know, the best athletes in the world just if so, if a coach or a physio says do that, then you do it, don't you? And that's what's going to get you better. But I think that's you're absolutely right. And I think there's also something to be said for wanting to stay relevant in some way. I hear that a lot and talk to my husband about it, who's 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 helped me and many players on the on the mental side of the game over my career and even now I'll be the one that will say oh there's an opportunity to go and do well you know a camp in Italy next week um should I go and he's like no we've got stuff with Leo you're not you're not going and I'll be like yeah but it's a good opportunity like it'll come again if it's that good and if they want you it'll come again it's not right for us and he's and I and I I'm quite good at just going yeah you're right actually I don't push it and I'm I, I feel like I've given everything I'd I had to drive towards achieving kind of trying to get to be world number one in in squash. So I don't have to go after it anymore now. And so I listened to him and I let him pull me back a bit. And I really trust in that. And I look to him for guidance more than anything. But I think that the thing he sees a lot with people he's worked with and retired is that relevance of you go from being totally relevant in a sport to irrelevant very quickly. I mean, it's relevant to who it, it's silly, but that's how you feel, I think, a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, it's the little it's the little person inside your head. Um, yeah. And I, was, I did a really, really bad job of explaining this to my wife the other night because she's saying to me, you know, why do you get up at six o'clock in the morning and you're outside the gym at six before it opens and re you don't have to do this anymore because you're not competing. What You're not trying to be a weightlifter. You're not trying to be a rugby player. What are you, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, it comes down to food as well. I'm quite rigid with the way I eat still and all this sort of stuff. But actually, I don't, I don't, it's not for a, it's not for a performance uh, level that I need in my life, even though sometimes running around from the kids, you need that, you need that. <laughs> um, but but it's, it's, it's a box ticking exercise in my head because if I don't feel like I've eaten the right things or I don't feel like I've, I've made those steps to be better myself daily like i'm not really doing myself uh, you know putting myself in the right position to take advantage of the opportunities i have um now simon knows me quite well and there, there's an element to me which is like is i've got a slightly addictive personality so that if, if i if i'm into something i'm in uh, yeah. and and i think that's how, how, do you, how have you found that with yourself to reach to reach the heights that you have? You have to have had that, surely. Yeah. I, do you think that that's a common trait for successful athletes in general, though, that there's a little bit of control, a control element there and a little bit of even borderline. I wouldn't say OCD in, actu in actually having OCD as a condition, but even you know, just having order in your in your own head, if nothing else. And that's what I feel like I've got. I've got lists, I've got orders. I hate it when I forget things. I, you know, I know what I'm doing. I like to plan and I drive people crazy with what we're we having for dinner in three days time because I'd like to go and make sure we've got the stuff in, um, you know, whereas it's just, it's just the way that you are. And I think you have to be like that to be successful as an athlete. And the better you get as an athlete, the more you, you drill down into that and the more you have to be, you know, 
the thing the thing with sport is that people talk a lot about the one percent don't they i think we spoke spoke about this simon that one percent and those bits are so important they are the they are the one percent where you have to have your food prepped to take with you to train him so you're not buying a costa panini and a, and a flat you know you can pull through the so many times i've pulled through a costa or starbucks drive through and gone i'll have an americano with milk and i feel like i'm having a treat because it's milk and not black and if i've not got my lunch with me i'm, I'm kicking myself because i know that i'm going to not only down a heck of a lot more calories than i should be but it's they're, they're useless calories in terms of training not now obviously i would just get a muffin as well but um, yeah. absolutely rinsed and you'll be, you'll be 20 quid down you've only bought a bag of crisps <laughs> yeah, exactly and you're crazy so you have to have that you have to have the control you have to have the discipline and they're all the one percents the the picking you um you know, getting your food prep, doing it when on a rest day when you don't want to do it, it's there for the week or it's there the night before and you take it with you and they're the things that make the difference. But there, it's also having having the, the actual bulk of the cake ready too. And I see a lot of the athletes, you know, a lot of athletes that I work with, they, they don't actually get the cake right and they're just looking for the 1% and the icing on the top. And I think those, I think when you when you make it to the very top of your game that control element comes from trying to get the cake and the icing right and you're trying to just make an amazing cake all round with everything so it, and that takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of control and then you, the more the more success you have with that the more addicted you know and i think a lot of athletes have an addictive personality as well um in a good way, addicted to the rush addicted to doing things right addicted to the good feelings of getting the training done I've cried more after training because I'm proud of myself for the sessions that I've done than, I, than, than, than because I've, you know, lost the practice match or had a bad session. It's that pride that comes with doing things the right way, isn't it? Yeah. And, and actually knowing you two, um, because both of you got to become successful through hard work um, and, and it wasn't some kind of innate natural talent that you had and you were just great when you walked onto the, either the squash court or the rugby field. Um, and found it easy, you know, because because both of you worked to get it. I think that plays into this because the, the evidence is this is the stuff that I need to do to be successful. I can't just walk onto the field or walk onto the court and, and just go and win. Um, you know, I need to work at this. So the, the evidence is there in your experience to tell you that's how you do it. Um, and I think, therefore, when you come out of uh, sporting life, you, you also bring all of that with you you bring that experience with you and and i think that's what probably um it almost like encourages you to keep that structure you know keep those habits with you because you know that that's been the foundation of your success to date i, th I think also laura you'll find that i i this is a bit of a counseling session for me <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, th I think also um i think this is what concerns me is like that obsession never leaves so that could be that could be a positive, but it actually can also be a pain in the ass sometimes. Um, because to your point, Simon, that's what's provided me with the last twenty years to tr just shut the door on it and go right. That's now out of the window. That doesn't work. You can't turn that off. So when I'm sat down, you know, watching Netflix with, with a family or whatever, my mind is running at a hundred miles an hour. Now, and I can't turn that off because I'm, I'm now thinking about, right, how am I going to plan that for the next few days? Or, or what does that, how is that sort of reflected over the next week? Or what do we have to do here, there and everywhere? So that, that structure, I, 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 I've never thought about it that way. You know, the, the sort of grafting element to the way that I've built my career, actually deep down without subconsciously or without consciously thinking about it, that's to me what, in my head, build success. So if I want to make transition and life after sport um, a success, that's what I need to do daily. Um, but that can also be to your detriment, I think. I think from, from, from my perspective, I'm trying really hard um, at the moment to to try to, to try to not have the expectation of myself and to try to enjoy life without having the expectation and the drive to be the best that I can be. So 
I wanted to finish my career, as I said before, knowing my, my, one of my mottos was to leave no stone unturned. Even my dad, as a young as a young girl, the, our family motto was you get out of life what you put in. I've been I've been brought up with that. You work hard and you'll get more. Um, and obviously that will never leave me and I believe in it. And if I was to grab something or set up something new now that I would I would throw myself into it. But I'm trying to give myself a little bit of a break, I think. I think probably is the best way to put it. I'm trying to give myself the credit that I deserve for what I've achieved already. And there isn't any, I'm not trying to be the best in the world at what I'm trying to do now. I'm, if anything, I'm probably just trying to be good enough. I'm trying to be a good enough mum. I'm trying to be a good enough squash coach. I'm trying to be a good enough, you know, trying to do this podcast as good as I can right now in this, in this moment. And all the other stuff I've done and I've deserved and I'm not trying to push to still make money. I just want to make enough money that I don't have to work all the hours that I can, um, that I, that I've got the time to do what I want, but not so that I'm earning money that I can't do what I want. And it, and it's, it's a really hard balance and I feel like I'm fighting it a lot of the time. I constantly say to people, I'm not really doing anything at the moment. And that's not true. I'm doing things all the time and, but they're little things and they're little wins. And the majority, maybe it's easy at the moment with a 16 month old because he is, you know, you're trying to be a good mum and you, you have committed to that when we decided to have a family. So I just, I, I guess it's more sort of like what, now rather than being the best squash player in the world it's about trying to be the i want to be there a bit more like happy and well-rounded and how do i want to leave the people around me because if i had have left the people around me during my squash career i would say that probably most people wouldn't have thought that nicely of me you know like not my family even would have been like yes yeah, she, she was great but she was determined and dedicated and she went after what she wanted and everybody else sort of went out the window which you hear so much don't you when selfish athletes are selfish they are but that's not who I am really so I guess what I'm trying to do now is be that be the person that I really am and I'm not selfish and I want to give back to the people who were there and you do that with your time don't you more with them with your money I think but it's not easy it's Simon I just I was staring at you there Simon uh, and, I, and, I, and I started looking at the shirt behind you. There is nothing about that Fijian Sevens team. There's no one in there that will be thinking along the same way that, that Laura and I would be. But they are at the top of their field and they have an amazing life. Now, there's an element of, in UK and British life, I think the, the, the sort of... Uh, you have to you have to be seen to be doing this, be getting that, but, and, and whatever it is. There's always the next. There's always the next thing. Now, whether you take that to the nth degree or you, you know, it's just daily life. It, if you were on Fiji, if you were on on the island, you wouldn't be doing that. Now they're yeah. happier in a far more. Um, I'm trying to word this rightly, which which clearly I'm not very good at doing, but. But um, they're, they're happier in a, in a far more uh, simple existence, but they're bloody good at what they do. Um, yeah. So you can get to the top of your game without having that. Yeah. Uh, we we have touched upon this a couple of times. I think this is, you know, a really critical point for people who are striving for success. There are a number of motivators. One is fear of failure. And it's really powerful. You know, that that kind of imposter syndrome that can drive you because the, the very fact that you don't feel good enough um, makes you strive and makes you work harder. It's a really powerful driver, but it's not necessarily healthy and it won't necessarily make you happy <laughs> no. because you will tend to be in that vacuous existence of, uh, I need to win the medal to feel good. Then you win the medal and you still don't feel good. So what the hell now, you know, and, and it's, it's almost like a perpetual hunger, but not a positive hunger. You know, it's, it's like you can keep eating and keep eating and you'll never feel satisfied. Um, whereas there, there is a flip side to it. You know, there's another potential driver, which is just a desire to explore your potential, uh, find out how good you can be, uh, keep enjoying the challenges. And when you do that, you, you're still pushing yourself, but it's not with that kind of I, I call it sometimes the barking dog behind you that, that's just forcing you to keep running because you're scared of not running, if you know what I mean. And looking at the Fijian guys, they are 
they tend to be driven by pretty positive drivers, you know, desire rather than fear. Um, and and I, I suspect that ours, and I'm sort of theorizing a little bit, comes from that American culture almost of uh, if you're not absolutely at the top, you're not good enough. You know, if you're not number one, you're number two, and that's that's first loser. Yeah. How is um? How would you say, Simon, that that is measurable? You know, so say we're being on the coaching side now and being very much having the barking dog behind me for most of my career, even to the point of you know winning, getting to world number one. And I, I spoke to you about this, like getting to world number one, and then freaking out because I felt like I had to then go and win everything that I entered after that, which was ridiculous because up until that point, I was just I was just trying to do the best that I could and the world number one flipped it and I felt like everyone was on my back chasing me then so but when I'm working with players now who are at the top of their game and and they and I'll say you know right what you know what do you want and they'll say I want to win this xyz and I'll say why or or how okay how do we go about that and 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 you're trying to you're trying to drill it down exactly to what you've said that desire and you know get it coming all from totally intrinsic motivation well, then how do you measure that? So what if they don't, what if that mean? what if that means they never get to lift the big trophy? How do you know that they, that the barking dog might not have got them to lift the trophy? And then at least they've got that, even if they didn't enjoy the journey totally. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and this is the balance between having a powerful driver and having a healthy driver. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, if, if you imagine some athletes, they can be physically quite strong, but they're not healthy at all. Mm. Um, and, and that might help them achieve something. But when you look at if you look that little bit deeper and ask that question about why achieving this thing actually matters, you can get to the point of going, so what? You picked up a trophy. So what? You won a medal. You know, the medal's just a metal yeah. disc on a ribbon. So, you know, afterwards, when we look back on this, will you look back on that fondly or not? You know, will you come to the point? And, and I know we've we've chatted about that kind of no regrets moment. Um, being able to finish whatever you're doing and say no regrets. Um, we, we've got that question around life as well. So, so this is this has got to be whatever we're doing has got to be a, a meaningful part of life. And if we sacrifice life to get X, we need to be able to look ourselves in the mirror. I think and say, yeah, that was worth it, and that, that was a good choice. Not look back on it later and go, well, I, I got X, but I lost Y. And actually, you know, I, I won a five and lost a tenner in the process. Um, because when, when we look back at life, we probably wouldn't say no regrets. We'd probably say, OK, yeah, I, I managed to get the medal, but look what I look what it cost me. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting. It's an interesting point. And actually, various people call it call them choices. They're the choices that people made rather than the sacrifices. Well, mm. those choices, there's some, there's some, I mean, if they weren't sacrifices, you, it's pretty hard to dress them up as choices. If you look at, if you look at the number of athletes that, that get divorced through sport, um, you know, the number of athletes that, that have some, some pretty severe things go wrong through their careers. Actually, if they're choices, you know what are we doing <laughs> because mm, yeah. actually, that, that drive to have you know um in my case a little red cap in my son's room it's like what what was it all for um so I, you start to talk about it like that it's like well, you know we need to we need to that that constant reassessment of what we're doing it for i think is really important um mm -hmm. Laura, you, you've hinted a bit about uh, uh, towards what you're doing now. Um, tell us, tell us, us and the listeners, you know exactly what you're up to, what, how you're enjoying it, um, and and how the probably the body. I hope the body is is taking a bit more of a rest. <laughs> it is. It is. I um, I was really lucky throughout my career. I say lucky. I had a um, a heck of a good team, and also that discipline we've talked about in terms of doing all of my prehab rehab everything was was a lot about injury prevention so i've been really lucky i retired for a squash player who's normally knees back ankles hips are totally mashed by the end of a career i was really lucky i didn't have any of that maybe a bit of a dodgy left ankle but not not too bad and then in retirement decided to try and play a semi well it's a pro league to be fair um decided i didn't want to lose and dislocated my kneecap and tore my mcl so it was like pretty horrific <laughs> injury post 
in retirement. So the lockdown was quite good for recovery, uh, for getting, for not pushing it too hard. Um, so I've been, it's, it's forced me out of the game, to be honest. And then I, and then I got pregnant with my little boy. So I haven't really ever got back on the squash court in any sort of competitive way, which has been maybe, maybe quite nice, I guess, in terms of not having, not, not pushing myself from that front and been able to really immerse myself in the coaching. Um, I, I, I love working technically. I've, I've got a real eye for that. And I loved it when I was playing. I love helping players with that. So I, I love looking at players play and seeing their chinks in their armor and then trying to expose that and helping my players to expose that. Um, so coaching is the main thing. And I, I think I, I'm most passionate about that. I'm also w working with England squash on the junior level and um, wrote a book which came out just after COVID. So I'm doing a little bit of a squash tour book tour with that now that all the clubs are reopened and, and whatnot. And yeah, just, just a lot of a lot of fingers in a lot of different pies really which is which is also exciting and and different and it keeps it keeps everything fresh which is ultimately why I love squash as well it was one of the reasons I loved the game was every single day was different in training your training your skills your training is it's one of the toughest sports out there I mean I, I did listen to your podcast with Kathy Bishop who was a rower that's insane <laughs> and I and I heard a couple of you know Simon say there's perhaps like long distance running middle distance running but cross-country skiing but squash is like brutal as as, as ter in terms of that cardiovascular fitness that you need for an hour so I, w I would have really struggled with a sport like rowing but the the sport in general speed endurance strength skill tactics technique everything that comes with it I, w I loved that every single day so I love that my life is a bit like that now as well do you, do you, do you prefer are you happy are you, I'm not sure you're ever happy about this thing <laughs> but are you happy that that option to play has been almost taken away from you yeah because I because because I think I'd have I'd have tried and I'm too competitive to then not not keep myself and I pro probably an injury was coming my my brain was still up to speed and my body wasn't it was I retired in the May and the injury happened in the October so it was just enough time I was ticking over I was still in good shape I was still playing all right I was you know probably still playing top top 25 in the world level but my my body wasn't as strong as it should have been and, and maybe it was a freak accident my foot was planted and I got a nudge and my and my foot was down and my knee went right and my foot didn't so maybe it was just a bit of a freak but I'd never had an injury like that my whole career and I, I worry now that you know I was out for so long it was so painful that if I if that happened now with the 16 month running around I don't actually know how I'd, how I'd be able to handle life. Simon I don't know whether you're thinking this but I'm definitely thinking this if you swapped what Laura was saying and put it put it coming out of my my voice and uh, swap what I was saying and put it coming out of Laura's voice, um, apart from maybe have, getting pregnant, I think everything could be said by the other person. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's a bit scary, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's really scary. I can just like uh, listening to you. I'm like, right, yeah, so I've done that. I, I, I feel that. I get it. Like, that's what I say. That's how I feel. The um, and uh, to the point where. I don't, I've still had that competitive edge. I played in a Vets game last year and I tore my bicep and I've never done anything like that. <laughs> um, and and Simon knows how hard I've worked on those biceps and it now, <laughs> it now looks like an absolute P in a T-shirt. So it's ridiculous. Oh, but, no. <laughs> I think that element of, of, you know, continuing to compete, I almost wish that that sort of been removed from me because there's an element which oh, I can still do that, even though, even though actually... Um, my brain is moving far faster than my feet. Um, yeah, exactly. What's, um, how, how do other people, do you think, perceive you post-competition? Do they, you mentioned you had your on-court face, your off-court face. Do, do they find you far more relaxed now as a person or, or, or you know, how, how are they sort of feeding back to you? I think so. I'm, I'm not, I'm not actually as, as immersed in the squash world anymore as as maybe I'm making it sound or maybe you know I'm not traveling to events um with the players that I'm working with I'm not I'm not watching a lot of, a lot of squash I'll watch my players if they're on and they they if they're on squash tv or they've got a link to a youtube channel if it's a smaller event I'll watch them um I guess I, I guess 
there's one way, isn't there, to try not to what's what's the like you know everything I spoke about before about trying not to be this um this relevant person anymore. I've had my time and I'm you know I'm working with a with a New Zealand player who's five in the world at the moment and we had a really good chat yesterday about you know how how uh, she's four four in the world at the moment so how she's gonna you know just just you know attack the next the next season or so and and it was more about like should I sh- should I get a little bit more involved with her and she she actually rang me the day after I announced my retirement and said you know I've played you you've played all the players that I'm playing on tour you know how to beat them I want you on my team will you work with me? And it was a huge shock because I just announced my retirement. There was emotions left, right and centre. And and I remember thinking, wow, what a compliment that, you know, she's literally has since said, I was just waiting for you reti- to retire and I was picking up the phone. And I never knew she thought that of me or even the conversations that we have now. So I think, um, and I think that probably the other players thought she was bonkers because you know, I wasn't that popular on tour. I didn't have a lot of friends and I quite liked it that way. I traveled with my coach and my husband and I kept myself quite, to, quite kept, kept myself to myself deliberately. Um, so it was quite nice that someone, I guess in a way had that maturity to see beyond that. And and actually we've got a great relationship, you know, you you give what you've give, given at the time and um, I try to help her as much as I possibly can. So yeah, I think, I think it's, it's trying to be passionate, but not try to make it about me anymore. It's about about her and the players I'm working with. And, and I think that's a, there's a really strong point in there because I've come across a lot of coaches who probably didn't achieve what they wanted to in their own careers. So they're trying to almost like achieve for themselves through their coaching. And, and that changes the agenda because actually it still is about them and yeah. about what they look like and what they're achieving, et cetera. And it's, it's not actually about the players particularly. Yeah, but Simon, do you think that that's also the case for the players sometimes? I see a lot of players who did achieve what they did. And then is there a flip of, I don't want to, uh, I, I was going to say maybe it is the right word, almost embarrassment if the players they're working with aren't achieving what they did achieve as well. Like, could it be that way too? M- maybe, but... I, I, the really good coaches that I've seen are actually pretty comfortable in their own skin. Um, yeah. And I, I've seen a lot of coaches who who still have a, a kind of an agenda that's wound around them and their own success. And and they interact very differently, particularly when the players are in those sort of pressure cooker moments. You can right. see the coach, rather than reverting to being calm, um, start to get quite agitated because their ego is still invested in, in this performance. Yeah. Um, and and I think there's a, you know, there's there's almost like a, a right level of intensity sometimes. You know, you, sometimes a coach needs to push the players, yeah. But not for the coach's benefit, for the player's benefit. Um, and and this is where I think some coaches get confused. Uh, yeah. and, and I have tended to see that more in the coaches who probably didn't finish their own playing careers, thinking no regrets, no stone unturned. They probably walked out thinking, I've still got something to prove. Jose yeah, Gareth Southgate, that sort of scenario, right? Yeah, I mean, you can kind of see in the way that they interact with their players, really, whether this is about them or whether this is about the playing group. Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I know you've, I know you've cheated, Laura, and you've checked cheated. Up on, yeah, you've checked I'm prepared. Up on, no, <laughs> <laughs> steady. Let's not. <laughs> Uh, so I'm expecting some blinding answers here. <laughs> oh no, you weren't supposed to say it live. <laughs> um, but we always finish with the, with the same four questions. Uh, I still have to write them down, um, which is embarrassing. But if you, weren't, if you weren't a pro athlete, what do you think you would have been? Well, my answer this morning before talking to my husband about preparing for the answer was... Um, I think I'd have gone down, obviously, sport, sporty. Everybody sort of says that, don't they? Um, I did human biology at A-level. Um, I would have probably gone into some sort of physio role. And really, I do actually really enjoy even my own sort of body figuring out, like, where my tightness is, where it's coming from, fi- trying to fix it. And so I, I was going to say a physio. And then I said, to da- I said to Donnie this morning, but I probably never would have been a physio, let's be honest, because I was always going to be a squash player. And he went, well, I think you should probably say that then. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so the an the answer um, probably is I pretended that I was giving myself some options and people always say, when did you know you were going to be a pro squash player? And to be honest, I didn't know until I deferred my place to go to university that I was going to give it a proper good, proper, you know, a real good shot at trying to be the best that I could be. But I never really applied for a course. I just applied to go to uni on a sports scholarship and didn't really know what I was doing. So I didn't plan. I didn't make a plan B. Um even though I've never actually realised that until I was thinking about this question this morning. So thanks for that, because um, I had a new realisation of, yeah, I, I don't think I, I don't think I would have been. I probably would have just stumbled my way through, you know, squash and and ended. I probably would have ended up being, you know, a, a personal trainer or something, in all honesty, because I spent so much time down the gym. Um, I worked on David Lloyd reception and behind the bar on my rest days and on my half day off during the week to earn some money to be able to play at those beginning parts of my career. So I would have stumbled into a job at David Lloyd, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, this is a very long, long answer to a short question, but I actually, the reason I had that job behind David Lloyd reception um, is one of the reasons I succeeded at being a squash player because I hated it. And I hated standing <laughs> behind reception at 6 a.m. in the morning for you, waiting for someone like you to open for me to open the barrier for them. <laughs> Sorry, I've forgotten my card. Can you let me in? Oh, brutal. <laughs> I'm half asleep. <laughs> um, who is the person you most admire in sport and in business? Um, for me, this is Serena Williams. I think with with every and and I like the fact that it sort of ties both in one, the sport and and the business because of who she is, where she's come from, what she's had to face. Um, and then just the way that she plays the game with that fierce and, you know, she, she's ferocious when she's on court. She's, you know, someone to just that you've got to deal with and she's bringing everything she's got to the court and if and you've got to beat her with that. And I loved I loved it. I loved watching her play. Um, and, and then from what she's done from a business side, setting up, um, you know, her own jewellery line and clothing line and everything and, and, and many things beyond that. But I think for me and, you know, talk about empowering women in this world, she's definitely one of them. OK, and you've got some funds to invest that you saved up when you're on the front desk, at David Lloyd. Um, what are you going to invest it in? So... I did. I did already invest a little bit in cryptocurrency, and I probably should have. I probably would have invested more at the time if I'd have uh, if if I'd have had it. Uh, so so maybe depending on the time, because you have to be, obviously the timing has to be right with that. I maybe would have looked into that. But when I was th when I was thinking about this question, I thought, you know, what would be the most exciting thing for me to invest money in would be someone who was a friend or someone I knew who had a startup business, an opportunity where they came to me and said, I just need a bit of money and I've got this idea and it's brilliant. And to go on that journey with them, to be able to invest a little bit of money and, and see them grow their, with their desire and their, yeah. their, their passion and, and hopefully for it to be the next Apple, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that would, that would be probably where I'd try and invest if I was looking to. Like it. And given you have seen the questions, this one's going to be a, a good answer, I know. There's one film that you can watch for the rest of your life. What's it going to be? Well, I'm going to cheat slightly. And this is a bit, well, yeah. is it a cheat? <laughs> um, and I'm going to say Harry Potter, mainly because um, that covers me for about six movies, seven movies. Eight, um, eight yeah. Mm. I love it. I, but if I had to pick one out of all of them, it would be Deathly Hallows Part 2. Um, I loved it. And you know what? I think this is this is probably the thing that people wouldn't realise the most about me. I love, and do you know the first movie that actually pops into my head? And this is probably slightly embarrassing to say. Um, it would have been The Little Mermaid. I've watched <laughs> that hundreds and hundreds of times over my life. And I love all Disney movies. I love Fro Frozen is another one. That song, Let It Go, I had on my warm-up playlist on repeat for about a season and a half. That the words in that that movie "Let It Go" was exactly what I needed. I needed to let everything go and just play. And I had it on my. I love Disney. I love it for that. And I, I guess it's some sort of weird escapism for me. I love yeah. the Hunger Games. I love Harry Potter. Yeah. I love anything that's just not like real life. Based, you know, not not real life, but that sort of stuff yeah. that's a bit different. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and I was going to go for something inspirational like Rocky and, you know, like, yeah, I love it. And I do love Rocky, but I, I, I wanted to be a bit more true to that, that, that escapism that people just love for a reason, don't they? No, it's been brilliant to chat to you. Um, really, really interesting. Some of, some of the things you've said, they've, they've certainly resonated and helped me. Um, it's, it's, it's been really, really great sort of 43 minutes chatting to you. So we really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Loved it. Take care. See you soon. You're listening to Podium Podcast with former England rugby player Tom May and leading performance coach Simon Hartley. From locker room gossip to fascinating high-performance insights, this is the show that invites some of the biggest names in the world of sport to discuss life on and off the field of play. Podium Podcast is brought to you by True Potential. To find out more, visit www.tplp.com.